Namaskar, Malayshok, with another session of Shraddha and Pradnya. This is session number 39 in this Pradnya, Shraddha and Pradnya series. And this would be a concluding session on archaeology evidence for flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. After this, we will get back to discussing planetary evidence from the Mahabharata text, specifically planetary evidence that is inner planets, which is Mercury and uh, Venus. And uh, then we will continue with the sun and moon, therefore eclipses, the positions and phases of the moon, the position of the sun and uh, of course there is a lot more astronomy evidence uh, to decipher all right so this is the last session on the flooding and destruction of krishna's dwarka in 5525 bc we have looked at multiple data points uh, so let's count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there are 12 data points, different types of data, uh, oceanography, sedimentology, uh, seismology. Now, I don't know if I counted seismology in this. Probably not. So that's the additional episode related to Krishna's Dwarka and uh, the potential signals that were seen before actually the flooding happened. Uh, is there any evidence related to seismology? So I did one episode on that. I'm trying to think, must be under Dr. No uh, shorts or could be Shraddha and Pradnya. But you guys are watching in a more uh, logical and sequential fashion, then I'm creating these. So you will definitely know which one I'm referring to. So in this episode, what we will do is we will look at multiple additional evidence, uh, archaeology evidence around the world related to uh, flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka in 55-25 BC. Uh, whereas until now, we typically dedicated one episode, like episode each for each of these locations, we will not do that. I think by this time, uh, you should have a very good idea as to the kind of evidence that is available. And if uh, after this, even just at what we have shared so far, if somebody is not convinced, then the problem is not with the evidence. The problem is with that individual. Besides, this uh, objective of this series is not to take uh, somebody who is hard to convince and somehow uh, try to convince that individual. That's not the idea. In fact, this is meant to be someone who is very swift, very crisp, uh, have a decent level of intelligence, may not have the background knowledge say about astronomy or about archaeology or about oceanography or climatology. And that's perfectly fine because each of these episodes are complete by themselves, at least at the level where person can understand what is, what is happening, what kind of evidence is being shown. And if they are curious, additionally curious, they can always go back to the uh, research paper or a book or whatever that report. Uh, and usually I provide the reference and uh, they can start their own journey in terms of getting deeper into that subject. So let's look at multiple additional evidence from around the world. So let's start with South Africa. Okay, so what is the evidence? This is the paper name and the area under investigation is the that bottom portion, you know, most people know the town, Cape Town, you know, know the place, city called Cape Town, okay, sort of the southern tip of Africa, a beautiful place, actually. Uh, and what the evidence shows there is that very similar, very consistent, we have seen this, by this time, it should be by heart, 
you know, in, in your mind. The chronology reveals a basal age of uh, about 8,400, so 8,500 BP, which is what? Uh, 6,500 uh, BC. So somewhere there, this particular data set began, depending on the nature of data they were looking at, okay? Uh, at a lake that is uh, connected to the ocean. And then the this particular paper tells us that there is a uh, like paleo ecological and elemental analysis indicate that marine incursions, meaning the seawater coming inside this lake, which is at the mouth of a river. And uh, when did that happen? Between that 6,500 BC to 5,000 BC. I'm just converting those BP into BC, all right? Uh, and then after 6000 BC, were, if you look at it, the this particular basin of this lake was infilled with sediment resulting in an intermittent uh, freshwater lake similar to present, which is to say what? There is not much movement after that and the sea levels have stabilized. Okay, that's what it is saying very consistent with what we have seen, what we have seen before. As I said, remember 5525 BC, but also remember 4000 BC, which is same as 6000 uh, BP. This is the curve from this particular paper. Okay, and what do we see? If I, against this empirical data, if I uh, overlap or superimpose the prediction for Krishna's Dwarka, uh, that falls right there, which is right in the middle of uh, sudden uh, sea level rise. Okay, that's what you see. And that's all is there to this. Okay, uh, let's look at the Atlantic coast of France. Again, a situation somewhat similar, like uh, what is that river? Yeah, the, I don't know how to say that in French, but the Ch Charente or Charente or whatever that river is. That is the area also and a river flowing there and merging or meeting with the Atlantic uh, Ocean. And that's where this data comes from. Uh, two different sets of data from more or less same area. And notice, depending on, again, we have seen this, depending on the source information that is used, the type of data, for example, the sea level versus spit formation or something else, okay? Depending on the nature of data, and if sometime a change of location, look at those two data sets. Directionally, they are same, but uh, some of the wavy things, ups and downs that you see into this data from 1973 paper are simply absent into the other paper. That, again, that has to do with the method of dating used, the material, the source data that was used, you know, how it was uh, how, what method, you know, tantra yukti, you can say, that was employed to estimate the sea level rise that can have these effects. But quickly, for our purposes, again, let's superimpose our prediction of 5525 BC uh, for flooding of Krishna's Dwarka against this data. And what do you see? A beautiful match. If you take that dotted line, then right in the middle of the sudden sea level rise, it's there. And if you take the peak, I'm not uh, trying to manipulate anything, you know, think of this x-axis here, 8,000 and 6,000 BP, we have to find 7,500. So 7,000 7, is here and somewhere half is 7,500 here. That's all I have done. If I go further to the left, just a little bit might be for 7,500, then that's like the peak peak, of this uh, curve from 1973 paper. The bottom line is uh, it corroborates, it validates a sudden sea level rise in at that time, even in France, that is the takeaway. Let's go to Sundasha, which is what? The landmass, you know, going further to Myanmar, which is old Brahmadesh, Laos, and then Thailand, and then if you, if you are good in geography, if not, just go to Google or just maps in Google. And just below Thailand, like the, you know, the, the extension turns into Malaysia. And at the end of it is the island of Singapore and so on. 
So that's on the shelf. If you go back, as, as you may know, that there was a huge landmass, which is now uh, underwater. Okay, so that's, that's on the shelf. And what do we see there? That's, I mean, you can see that now. Okay, so the uh, sort of a darker gray areas are what what are lands right now. So this is uh, this is that Sumatra island. You know, this is where we saw the evidence from a cave, uh, Achebanda, in the context of uh, Krishna's Dwarka uh, flooding. Okay, and different tsunami records. Then this is this is Thailand here, and at some point here, this is Malaysia, and then we have Singapore here. This is a portion of Indonesia, just like this is Indonesia. This is Jakarta and all. And the northern portion of this area is Brunei, for example. And then we have uh, Philippines. And then this is also part of uh, Indonesia. And then you go further to uh, Papua New Guinea, New Guinea, and so on, okay, further east. Uh, anyways, and, and yeah, and if you go here, then that will be the portion of Vietnam. This is the Red River area. If you see this, we have done all of this, okay? And what they did in this paper or report is that they have pulled this data for this region from three different research papers and combined it together. In fact, notice they do not have any data uh, for the last 4,000 years. And in their paper, they said that if, Indeed, they would have taken the data from additional studies. It would have shown the water level coming down, coming down to where? Notice in 4000 BP, so 2000 uh, BCE, 4000 years ago, this mean sea level is about five meters above current mean sea level. So the water indeed will have come down, would have come down to zero. That's what they're saying. But let's superimpose our prediction uh, for flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka, 55, 25 BCE. And what do you see? Yeah, it is at the end of that significant pulse that we are seeing. Again, the uh, variation that we see for the timing of the data points and the pulse of course, it's happening for last 20,000 years, but in terms of its intensity is again driven by many different things that we have discussed so far, so I will not repeat those. So again, a good validation, good corroboration. Let's go to Florida. Now, we have looked at Mississippi, which is to the west of Florida. We have also kind of looked at uh, east of Florida, which is the Caribbean, the West Indies, okay? So we shouldn't expect a surprise, but and it's, there is no surprise. However, notice where they are taking this data for this study, okay? It's along the coast, and if you have been to Florida, especially the Miami and that area, it's pretty flat. It's like Tamil Nadu, you know, in terms of uh, the uh, altitude from the seashore, okay? And so this is more like a delta formation, pit formation, marshy lands. So kind of interesting data than other places where uh, the distinction from land to ocean is very sharp, okay? That's not the case here. Case here. If you have been to Key West, you know that, you know, the, the whole journey. These are the multiple locations from which they have these data points. The point I want to make it is, therefore, the curve here has appeared much flatter in comparison to what you have seen in other places. Not a surprise, because you have seen flatter curves before. Even then, if you superimpose our prediction of 5525 BCE, and if I draw the tangents, guess what? You know, again, that definitely becomes a point of inflection, okay, or a point of change of slope there, okay? Yes, in, in a significant way, and again, very beautifully corroborates uh, the 55-25 BC. This is from Florida. Let's go to Philippines. Now I'm kind of bringing you from the West to the, all the way to Asia, back to America, and so on. Uh, we will also go to South America and that area too, but we'll also do back and forth. So let's go to Philippines. This one I found only as an abstract, and I couldn't find the paper. But something still interesting, even in this abstract, is what they're referring to is that this RSL, which is what, relative sea level, rose rapidly until 7500 uh, BP, which is what, 5500 BCE, 
very important okay and then in this particular paper abstract they're saying actually it dropped abruptly to one meter now i don't know why that happened it seems if you read their abstract that they also <laughs> don't know and they are saying they are working to figure it out and so on. But I didn't find the paper, so that's that. But still notice 5500 BCE, okay? This is uh, from Philippines. The second paper from Philippines, uh, okay? This specifically, um, let's see, I can see it. Specifically, I forgot the area, but it's marked there with that red uh, truck, okay? Uh, so that's the area, and uh, when they have put together the data, this is how uh, the sea level changes look like. Again, I will superimpose the timing of the uh, flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka, 5525 BC, and definitely it is somewhere in the middle, not exactly middle, but somewhere in the middle of that sudden sea level rise, okay? Uh, all right. This is another paper, number three for Philippines, okay? And the location for that is again shown on the map and very impressive, very clean, clear data, okay? The x-axis again is the time axis before, uh, before present and the y-axis is the sea level, okay? So again, if you superimpose 55, 25 BC uh, location, then what do you see? It's right towards the end of that sudden sea level rise Remember, after that particular time, Krishna's Dwarka flooding and destruction, the water at Dwarka itself and everywhere around the world, the water level continued to go up, up to about what? Up to about 6,000 BC, sorry, 6,000 BP, if you remember, which is 4,000 BC. And then either it is flat or it is going down. And that provides a decisive evidence against anyone claiming flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka anytime after 4000 BC. Now, why is this important? Well, it's not really required, but because many researchers have found some flood record and therefore backwards claimed a Mahabharata dating, which is utterly foolish, unscientific, illogical, okay, inconsistent, I mean, stupid. But many people have done that. On the other hand, what is required to be done is that first you find out from an independent evidence the timing of Mahabharat war. And then you add 36 to it, that gives you a prediction for the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. Because remember, we are not just looking for some flood or a series of floods around the world. We are looking for a specific flood a, sp a specific event where suddenly sea level rose, which has to have a connection with the Mahabharata war. So first we have to figure out Mahabharata war. You know, this has to do with understanding the causality, okay? The causal direction, or uh, we can say in the Nyaya Darshana or a Darshana Shastra language, Karya Karana Bhav. Okay, so we already already feel confident about 55, 16 BC. Therefore, we go 36. Now we get 55, 25 BC, and now we look for evidence around the world. Okay, so very very impressive by the way in this case. Let's go to uh, Malay Thai Peninsula. Actually, we did look at it uh, somewhere. I forgot what that data point was. Uh, I forgot now. Uh, I think in Thailand possibly. Yes. Uh, but as I said, the geographically Thailand and then the bottom portion, the southern portion is Malaysia. So from that peninsula area, let's look at, yeah, so you can see the map here. This is beautiful here. So this is Burma, Brahmadesh, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. So this is the Champa Kingdom. Okay, we saw the evidence for Red River here. Uh, all right, we looked at some of the evidence uh, from the Sunda land that is here. This was all land at a certain point. And this is Malaysia here, this is Singapore. So we are going to look at this uh, Malay Thai Peninsula, this area now. You know, actually they have given the locations also. Something very impressive, look at it. Uh, please have a look at on the right side. Uh, let's see how many locations, six, seven, eight different locations. And everywhere, consistent sea level rise and you will start seeing the connection of that if we superimpose our prediction for flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka in 55-25 BC 
in all these first three cases, right in the middle or towards the end of that sudden sea level rise. If you do that for the additional three locations, ditto, exactly the same thing, and essentially the same thing for the further additional two locations. So total of eight locations in this peninsula area, very consistent picture, okay? 455, 25 BC. Now, if you combine this data, let's say, what do you see? Okay, because remember, the, this data is coming from different uh, places around this peninsula. So again, uh, a beautiful picture emerges. For example, uh, 55, 25 BC is here, right in the middle and towards the end of that sudden sea level rise. But also, if I draw the tangents based on the data that I have, Again, I get a picture which is very consistent, identical to everything else that we have seen, which is what? A sudden sea level rise going up to, of course, at the time of the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka, 55-25 BC, but it still continues to rise until when? Until like another 1,000 years, another 2,000 years, until like five. Uh, 5,000 BC, so 55, 25 BC, then additional 500 years, 5,000 BC, possibly up to 4,000 BC, that's 6,000. That we saw at Dwarka and many other locations, we are seeing the same picture here. And then the water level is going down. It may have its local ups and downs, but directionally it is going down, reaching to current level uh, of mean sea level, which is at zero. And again, just like I showed that for Dwarka, this explains why Lothal, Dolavira were ports uh, between, say, 5000 BC to 2000 BC. And after that, why they were not the ports. Okay. And so the water level is actually receding, the sea water levels. We saw that on the east coast of India also at Pumpuhar, where after um, uh, 4000 BC, the water started receding from Mayuram, it came to Sirkazi, from Sirkazi, it came to Nangur, and then by 500 BC, say about 2000 years ago, came to the current level Pumpuhar. Very consistent data around the world. Let's go to Southern Hemisphere. Now here, the data is kind of, uh, I mean, they're trying to do this wherever they can find. Notice the locations are from all over, from Polynesia, and it's a totally different dynamic still. One point here is there is no, when this event happened, is there some specificity, which is to say something happened uh, only in say Antarctica area, but did not happen at the equator or anything like this. And what you'll find is that's not the case. If you look at this plot, I think of latitude versus the timing. Uh, for practical purposes, of course, this is based on the data that is available, but even there you will see that the data is completely random. Okay, I mean, it's, it's a random data there. Um, so what does that tell you is that when you see a sudden sea level rise, uh, there is a, a we, feel, uh, we feel confident that yes, it is a global event, something catastrophic is happening and it's not happening in, uh, in some local fashion. So when suddenly sea level rise is happening, it's actually global in nature. It's not a local event. That's what this particular plot actually tells us. Now, we are looking at the southern hemisphere. <clears throat> so think of, uh, you know, that equator line in the middle. And this is the zero, zero line that you're seeing. And for most part below that, but if it is above, just close by, like we have a Sri Lanka here and we have this area of a Ghana and so on. Uh, if you want to pause the slide and read, hey, feel free, be my guest. But quickly, I'm going to show you, say, Buenos Aires, which is South America, Argentina. Uh, notice that the line that I have drawn, vertical line, is that 55, 25 BC approximately, or 7,000 BC possibly. But uh, so yes, it is in the middle of that uh, sudden sea level rise after 6,000 BC, which 6,000 BP, which is 4,000 BC. Remember, I ask you to remember that number. It's either flat or going down. Okay, so you may see that too. Now come to Tierra del Fuego, another location further south of. Uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. Again, a peak at 7,500, that peak kind of ended there. And afterwards, it's a downhill journey as you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, we're talking, all right? Uh, some of the graphs, which actually don't go as far as 7,500. So we cannot say what happened there. But 
for the range of the time for which the data is available, it is interesting to note that the sea levels is actually sea level is actually receding. Okay, sea level is going down. Okay, practically most of the places that you will see some places a bit crazy. I mean, we don't know exactly what's happening. All right, and some of the places where I have not marked anything. Uh, do spend some time note down those locations like 12 or 1 and 2. These are in the Polynesia, in small islands, you know, and uh, the data is not even available going back. But when it is there, it's a very messy data. You cannot take that data and try to uh, create a consistent picture the way we did from the global data uh, for the last 10,000 years, the entire Holocene period, okay? So you can ignore those, but if you want to study more, absolutely be my guest, okay? That doesn't change any of this conclusion. In fact, that data where I have not shown anything is inconclusive data, all right? So let's do the summary, okay? We started with whatever these 12 locations, seismology again at Dwarka, so same location, just instead of oceanography, seismology type of data. So that may be the 13th data point and whatever I just showed you right now, let's summarize that. So I showed you something from South Africa, beautifully matches with 5525 BC, something from Atlantic France, it also validates, corroborates with 5525 BC, uh, data from Sunda shelf. Now this data matches for 5525 BC, it's just that we do not have the data in this case for last 4,000 years. That's not an issue, I'm just, <clears throat> mentioning a point here, okay? And then we looked at Florida, okay? Along the tip of that panhandle, okay? Miami area and all the way to the Key West. It's a, a delta formation type of area, pretty flat surface. Uh, so we did not see that significant variations or significant sea level rise that we see otherwise. But even there, the point of inflection is right at 5525 BCE, the sudden sea level rise followed by a significant reduction in a sea level rise as observed there in Florida. Then we looked at Philippines, in fact, three different research papers, all pointing to 5525 BCE right at the middle or towards the end of the sudden sea level rise in 5525 BCE. Then we looked at Malay, Thai area, and uh, I'm forgetting now what I showed, but I think that I think that matches beautifully rather, okay? Very crisp and clear evidence, but I'm forgetting guys, okay? My, my apologies. And let's see, yeah. Then we had at Buenos Aires, uh, that 5525 BC, right when there was a sudden sea level rise, ditto for actually Tierra del Fuego. And again, very impressive uh, data from entire uh, southern hemisphere showing after this 5525 BC, the water level continued to go up for some time, but then up sometime meaning what? Up to 5000 BC, maybe 4000 BC. After that, it's a downward trend towards coming towards what we have uh, in our times, the mean sea level. All right, so that's the data quickly. Uh, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, global composite graph. Now, we looked at this evidence from around the world. Now, what for some some research purposes, and that makes totally sense, just like we actually saw this many times, a uh, researcher or a new group of researchers, when they are collecting their own data or not, they will, as a review paper, they may look at the existing data from multiple studies and try to create a composite picture, oceanography picture in this case, uh, from that. Nothing wrong with it. But if people lack scientific acumen, if people lack logical reasoning skills, and if people do not have either a background knowledge, or even when they have a background knowledge, they refuse to make use of it, okay? If you don't do that, the disaster is just waiting for you. And I'm going to show you an example of that, okay? Global composite graph. For example, many of you would have seen this graph, very, very popular graph. Uh, what is it doing? Some of the locations that, for example, we saw and we did not see, like Rio de Janeiro, for example, okay, Santa Catarina, Senegal. We didn't look at the Malacca Strait, Senegal. Okay, we did look at Australia, Jamaica, we did look at. Tahiti, we did not look at. Okay, Barbados, we did look at. So this, this on the shelf that we just looked at, 
And we actually looked at many more location, locations than shown here. The point is they used, they made use of somebody, made use of all this uh, data to create one composite graph for the sea level rise post glacial. So after the last glacial maximum, you can see that here, okay, around the 25,000 years, that, that's perfect. The last glacial maximum, maximum, some people actually think the ice age ended, blah, 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 in like 10,000 years ago, absolutely wrong. Sometimes it is confused because of the younger dryas, where the where the temperatures drop uh, for about 1500 years or so. Okay, now, uh, or they confuse because of the uh, North America still having glaciers until like 12,000 uh, years ago, 9,000 years ago, and so on. The problem with that is when you're talking about the end of ice age, one has to be very clear, end of ice age for who? I mean, if you are in Antarctica, the ice age has not ended. It's very critical point and must be understood. But when that is not understood, people will talk about uh, the uh, last glacial maximum, I mean, happening 14,000 years ago. I have even, I know of some uh, Indi pro indic researchers saying this statement, even now, okay? And then you will also hear uh, the, as far as the sudden sea level rise is this melt water pulse 1A. Okay, and then they will talk about 1B and so on. What is the problem with this? One researcher, Indic researcher, uh, he claims that this is the pulse, okay? This is that sudden sea level rise. And guess what now? Therefore, I said on the previous page, if you lack scientific acumen, if you lack logical reasoning skill, and you don't have a background knowledge or you refuse to make use of that background knowledge, what happens? So this individual took this meltwater pulse 1A, okay, combined with the 1B also, and claims, so what is that? Let's bring it down to say 14, I'm just making a crude one, 14,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, which is what? Uh, 10,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, take a half of that, and that's exactly what this guy did. Okay, so about 11,000 BCE, okay? Think of that as a 11,000 BCE. So 14,000 years ago, that's 11, uh, that's 12,000 BCE and a sort of a half of that. This person said, ah, the flooding and destruction of Dwarka actually, that is described by the way, I mean, this is where the hell of a confusion, you know, and it's very frustrating. I mean, why would somebody do that? But this flooding and destruction of Dwarka, and the person doesn't clarify, does he mean Krishna's Dwarka or not? But I'll come to that. That Dwarka actually happened here, about uh, 12, 11 to 12,000 BCE. So think of this as about 14,000 years ago, or between 12 and 14,000 years ago. Okay. Now, some landmass would have gone down, and Kushasthali might have been affected. Okay. The same place on which eventually 7,500 years ago, Krishna rebuilt okay, the place and called it Dwarka, Dwaravati. So Kushasthali is there for 30,000 plus years. So that's not the issue. But if you are referring to Krishna's Dwarka, then this researcher, this individual, I don't know if I want to call him a researcher, this individual <laughs> has claimed that this, this time, this 14,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, is what refers to flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. Remember, I talked about the Karya Karana Bhav, understanding the direction of causality. This individual is looking at this graph, not looking at Mahabharat. Okay? will refuse to look at Mahabharata, dare not look at Mahabharata because all the evidence goes against this individual's claimed year of the Mahabharata war. So what does he do? He looks at this pulse and, you know, ordinary folks just looking at it. And, you know, I'm saying, what's wrong with ordinary folks, guys? You know, this logic, you don't need to go to school to understand this. You can claim any of this peak as the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. But the question to ask is, did Mahabharata war happen there? Okay, people don't ask that. They just look at some graph and they think, oh, this is scientific data. I can trust it, blah, blah, blah. And then the person says, this is basically referring to flooding and destruction of Dwarka. Well, who's Dwarka? Okay, now, you know what? Somebody just driving through the red lights and the person says, I'm not stopping for red lights. It's wrong, but I have my agenda and I'm going to do it. 
So by luck, the person may able to successfully cross through a certain red light without uh, injuring others without or without injuring oneself or the car. Then another red light, another red light, another red light. You know what? The person is going to be caught at some point or going to end up in disaster or going to create a disaster for others. This is very irresponsible behavior. We say when you are driving, this is irres irresponsible behavior in research. So after saying that this is the flooding and destruction of Dwarka, I did not use the word Krishna deliberately. Then this person went on to propose that the Krishna of a Mahabharata is actually the, uh, the person claimed, what did he claim? Oh, yeah. So they, so then he goes to another Upanishad. Now, forgive me, I may not be saying the right name. I think uh, Mandukya Upanishad, I like to think, okay, but I could be wrong. But there is a reference to Ghora Angiras, okay, and Devaki Nandan Krishna as a student of Ghora Angiras. Then this person argues that, look, we know Sandipani was Krishna's uh, guru, but we have no reference in the Mahabharat or Bhagavad Puran or Hari Mausha uh, that Ghor Angiras was uh, the guru of a Mahabharat Krishna. Therefore, this Krishna, Devakinandan Krishna, a student of Ghor Angiras mentioned in Mandukya Upanishad, I think, or Chandogya, could be Chandogya, by the way, is different Krishna. And funny enough, now this uh, individual takes that Krishna and tries to connect with this time. So I mean, what a bizarre thing, guys. I have a tough time even explaining, okay, the logic or the lack of logic behind this. So because you see some sudden pulse here, well, what is this pulse? It's a well-known pulse, guys, by the way. This is, uh, if you look at the West Indies data, Paul Blanchon and data, this is a catastrophic rise event one. There are no surprises about this. But what you will find is the catastrophic rise event three and two that you saw in West Indies and many other places are not quite uh, demarked here. Okay, So for example, somewhere in this region, you have you have this sudden sea level rise, a very sharp sea level rise, but it's not delineated into a specific CRE event. Now, that is the precisely the reason why one needs to look at multiple sets of data and not just blindly take one data set. But it, this, this particular individual is acting as if uh, he has a deep agenda, whatever that agenda is. So the person claims this as the flooding and destruction of Dwarka. I did not say Krishna's Dwarka. But then he goes to Chandogya Upanishad and the reference is well known again, you know, like a Ghora Angirasa uh, taught to Krishna and there he's referring to, hey, you you may live for 116 years. Now he's actually adding the length of the different meters, like, you know, from the Grantha. Uh, and so they add up to 116. Based on that, some people have also speculated and it remains only speculation i have written a blog on it by the way that uh, krishna lived for 116 years the mahabharata krishna based on this chandogya upanishad so you see how the chandogya upanishad reference is a fact there is a mention of gorangiras there is a mention of uh, devakinandan krishna but how different researchers use it to suit their agenda Okay, it's a very interesting example and therefore uh, this is worth spending time. Now what this researcher did is uh, after claiming the Dwarka flooding and destruction happened in around that 14,000 years ago or between 14 and 12,000 years ago, then he moved the Devakinandan Krishna or he moved the Krishna to this particular time and saying actually Devakinandan Krishna has nothing to do with the Mahabharat Krishna. That is the claim of this individual. All he says is that Devakinandan Krishna belongs to a previous time, the Chandogya Upanishad, and the Chandogya Upanishad is a part of uh, uh, Yajurveda or whatever. And then he also makes another groundless claim saying, oh, Yajurveda happened in that 14,000 years ago. Well, you can show Yajurveda and the Yajurveda related Brahmanas uh, dating things going back to 20,000 years ago. But this fellow is not aware of this. 
So he says, ah, so that Chandogya Upanishad, whichever the Veda that it is a part of, and that Veda, he puts it around 14,000. Again, does not give explanation why it puts around 14,000, other than the fact he saw this graph. And therefore, uh, Dwarka was flooded and destroyed in this time. Remember, he is not making any connection with Mahabharata. In fact, he is taking away the connection. On what basis, only God knows. Okay, then using the Chandogya Upanishad, he moves Krishna to this time frame around like uh, 11,000 BC or so. Right. Now something more interesting. And therefore you have to watch my entire series on Shraddha and Pradnya, but also Dr. No Shorts. What now he does is, yes, he is insisting that Devakinandan Krishna of Chandogya Upanishad has nothing to do with Mahabharata Krishna. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. But that Devakinandan Krishna, and when uh, he, uh, I don't know what happened. Oh yeah, the, I think the council also goes back. I'm, I'm, guys, that's how. This is how bizarre this damn thing is. I think even that Devakinandan Krishna killing council also goes back to that eleven thousand BC. I have forgotten. Okay, actually, when I read that paper, I just gave up. You know, after five minutes, it is that nonsensical. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, the humor also can tire you, by the way, or frustrate you. And then what does he do? Okay, so Krishna, that Devakin, oh, Krishna has nothing to do with it. Now, interesting, interesting enough, this individual takes a reference of a comet, and therefore I want you to watch Dr. No Shorts, but also the Shraddha and Pradnya series. Okay, the Andaka's Comet, what I call Andaka's Comet, he takes that reference from Harivamsha. Now, what is the basis of Harivamsha? It is about referring to Krishna, only one Krishna, but Mahabharata Krishna. Okay, I'm saying Mahabharata Krishna because this individual has separated those into two Krishna. And, you know, anyways, uh, I will avoid the digression. Now what happens is, but this person has no compunction, no problem, doesn't see the problem of inconsistency, doesn't see the problem of illogic, comfortably goes to Harimosha, takes that comet uh, evidence and applies that now to 11,000 BC area because that's where he is assuming and claiming Devakinandan Krishna. But remember, his Devakinandan Krishna has nothing to do with the Mahabharata Krishna. Okay. And then with a very poor knowledge of astronomy, tries to say, look, there is this comet as described in the Harivamsha. First thing, that's not correct. The comet itself is not correct. But I don't want to talk about it because, you know, basically the uh, the uh, the premise itself is so disastrously wrong that why even look for a comet, which is wrong anyways. Something more. Do you think this uh, nonsense is over? No, it's not over. Then the person, when somebody questioned him, this person said, uh, Devakinandan Krishna is not to be found in the Mahabharata text. And so when something comes in the Harivamsha or the Puranas, that is a confusion of the Purana writers. Now, that small portion, I will agree that the Purana writers have got a lot of confusion because the confusion in the sense they are going by herd, you know, like a Shruti Smriti, but Smriti in the sense, whatever is remembered, they are trying to compile it. And a lot of confusion has definitely happened in the Puranas, no doubt about it. But just that notion that exists, he is trying to exploit that notion. And what does he say? He says that the Devaki Nandan Krishna is not to be found in Mahabharata. It is only to be found in Puranas and so on. But that is that Devaki Nandan Krishna of 11,000 BC and of Chandogya uh, Upanishad. What is the problem with this? Very recently, and of course, Jivan Rao had found few references. Occasionally, I would run into a reference in Mahabharata where Krishna is referred to as a Devakinandan Krishna. But, you know, just recently when I was pulling the data for something else, I just said, let me pull the data. I mean, look at everything Devakinandan Krishna. And uh, I started with Adi Parva and finally I got so exhausted and tired uh, by Udyoga Parva that I stopped. But right there between that, there are like a 5, 10, 15, 20 plus references to Krishna as a Devakinandan Krishna in a Mahabharata. And this individual 
claims that there is no reference to Devaki Nandan Krishna as a Krishna of a Mahabharata in the Mahabharata text. I do not understand which Mahabharata he is referring to and which Mahabharata he reads. Now, there is something else. And try this. First, find out who this person I am referring to. I am not going to give you the answer. Because then people start saying, oh, I am abusing them. No, I am just showing them the mirror. I am just showing them how nonsensical their research is. That's all I am doing. There is nothing personal about these individuals. So, um, if I'm just guessing, by the way, because this individual has used that argument multiple times in the past. If now you go and say, hold on, which Mahabharat text you are uh, referring to that doesn't have a, a Devakinandan Krishna? And then you show all these references, 20 plus just until the Udyog Parva. Okay, and somebody should uh, do a, a quick search, like control find kind of thing and find out additional Devakinandan references, Bhishma Parva through uh, Swargarohan Parva and all that. Then I wouldn't be surprised if this person now in, would invoke the uh, argument, which he has done many times for both Mahabharata and also Ramayana. He will say, oh, there are interpolations in Mahabharata. The Mahabharata that we have today is not the Mahabharata. Uh, uh, that Vasudev wrote. And again, he also has a very uh, faulty uh, assumption about Mahabharata. Assumption, I'm saying, because there is no evidence. In fact, the evidence of Mahabharata is exactly opposite, contrary to what he believes. But there are few, many other nuts who also believe the same thing, which is to say, initially, the Jaya was created of 8,800 verses. Then it expanded to Bharata of Vaishampaya. Then it expanded to 100,000 verses. That's atrociously nonsensical, baseless things. Hitchens Razor should apply. So now, when caught, why Devakinandan Krishna exists throughout this text of Mahabharata, don't be surprised if this person pulls this, his favorite argument that there are interpolations. What is nonsensical about this? Well, there are interpolations, there are part of it in all our ancient text, practically all our ancient text. There is no confusion about it. What is beauty is in spite of those interpolations, and we have enough evidence to most cases, if not all, to identify what the interpolations are. And in spite of the part of it, because of the very sophisticated astronomy that we have and the sophisticated language of Sanskrit, which really does a good job in describing ancient events in a meticulous language. Many times we have an ability to take those descriptions and test them empirically in a scientific manner using multidisciplinary evidence. And based on my limited study of last 30 years, specifically with uh, uh, Mahabharat, Ramayana, Rugved, and few others, but I'll just stick to these. The part of it actually help you understand uh, the your history better. The interpolations can be easily found out, and you may try to think what could be the motivation of this individual to insert such a thing. It can be found out. And if you cannot find it out, just leave it as it, unless it affects whatever specific thing you are trying to do, such as dating uh, the timing of Mahabharata or dating the timing of Ramayana or dating particular um, timing or a broad timing of Rugveda. How does it matter? It can stay as an interpolation. But these individuals, and specifically these individuals, but he's not the only one who is guilty, they will pull this uh, argument of interpolation only when they are caught okay, as the English expression goes, pants down, multiple times. So for as long as they can maneuver their way with some excuse to fool the ordinary folks, ordinary uh, shrad people with shraddha, okay, they will do this. And I truly fail to understand what's the motivation and what do they want to gain out of it. I mean, sometimes people will pull the statecraft. I mean, I understand that. I mean, I don't agree with it at least not in the kind of research that I'm talking. But here, there is no room for a statecraft. It's not some strategy here. Okay, now sometimes they, in my personal conversation, they have said that they have certain strategy and try to explain it to me. And sometime if I get time, I will explain what they have shared with me. And again, they will start uh, shouting abuse, but hey, that's perfectly fine with me. In fact, I take that as a garland, you know, every time somebody just claims something, you know, 
so that's the kind of nightmare you can create. And why? Because somebody did not pay attention to understand this graph, did not realize or did not know or deliberately did not care as to a varied data with multiple sudden sea level rises, the catastrophic rise even exist in this 20, last 20,000 years of data. When And the location matters. Okay, When that is lost, people come up with all kinds of crazy things when Ice Age ended. Always ask the question, Ice Age ended for who and where? As far as the India is concerned, okay, we had cooler temperatures when there was an Ice Age and other areas of the world where people cannot even uh, imagine living. Okay, There are thick sheets of ice glaciers a few miles high. India was an extremely vibrant place with the agriculture, domestication of animals, sophisticated astronomy, uh, a great civilization. So don't confuse this, guys. Okay. So this is a good episode, how it started with flooding and destruction of Dwarka. Now to match that, even the Krishna is pulled from somewhere using some uh, random reference to Chandogya Upanishad. Now, what is wrong? I mean, why Krishna cannot have multiple gurus? Krishna is talking about this in a, in a uh, Uddhav Gita. Okay, uh, just like we have the uh, Audhud Gita. Jojo Jaya Cha Guna Tyasi Guru Kela Jana Guru Syale Aparapana. Mahabharata text talks about Krishna taking a Shaivi Diksha multiple times. Okay, Krishna is the one who is chanting Shiva Sasranam. And Bhishma is the one who is chanting Vishnu Sasranam to Yudhishthira, reciting to Yudhishthira. Okay, Krishna has taken a Shaivi Diksha. There is a mention of it in the Mahabharata. So Krishna can have many gurus. Gorangirasa could be Krishna's guru, which is somehow missed in the Mahabharata, or I don't know if it's there in other Puranas. But that stray reference is not a reason to start there, but that's exactly what this researcher did. Possibly driven by this meltwater pulse 1A, 1B. So uh, flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka was, he didn't say Krishna's Dwarka. <laughs> He said Dwarka, because that time he may not be sure how to justify this. So Dwarka gets moved. The flooding of destruction of Dwarka gets moved to 11,000. Then, oh, now Dwarka is moved, so we have to bring Krishna there. So Krishna is also moved. And what basis? Zero. Zilch. No basis, no evidence of any kind. Not even a literary evidence. Forget about objectively testable evidence. Okay, Literary evidence is also not there, but objective evidence is also not there. And then to justify that Devakinandan Krishna, then another lie, another lie. What is that lie? That Devakinandan Krishna is not the Krishna of a Mahabharata and it's not mentioned in Mahabharata. And then uh, someone like me or Jivan Rao shows 20 references, 20 references in Mahabharata referring to Devakinandan Krishna. So all we have to do now is wait, not that I care, but you know, since many of the uh, people, Indian folks, Hindu folks with a Shraddha, you know, just blindly watch this guy's video. And many people send it to me. Many say, look, Nilesji, look at this. And I said, this is utter garbage. Just tell me in that video, any one claim for which there is a back backup evidence. Zilch. There is not even a single place for which there is a backup evidence. Literary evidence, but also objectively testable evidence. Zilch. Okay. All right. I think I said enough on this. Okay, now if we superimpose the 55-25 BC prediction, guess what? Yes, that is right at that inflection uh, point, right? The, the sudden sea level rise that's going on. Now, this is going on for 20 years, guys, with multiple uh, catastrophic rise events. But after that, you see it goes further up for some time, up to possibly like 6,000 BP, 4,000 BC. And after that, in this graph, this is a composite graph, it's flat. But as I said, in many other graphs, you will actually see going down. Okay. So uh, that's that. All right. And so this is approximately the second line that I drew here is approximately the area where this individual has created a chaos and a havoc and a confusion. Uh, okay. Vikalpa. Vikalpa for himself and Vikalpa for everyone who is following him. Okay, I have no problem people following him as long as guys you understand what who you are following, what you are following, and why you are following. All right. 
Uh, so let's go to the summary. The Mahabharata war happened in 55-61 BC. Again, the 18 days beginning with 16 October to 2nd November. Multidisciplinary evidence exists from multiple these different fields that are listed here and that are not listed here. All validate, corroborate 55-61 BCE, but more important, only 55-61 BCE. All right. Krishna's Dwarka was destroyed by a sudden uh, rise of sea level, sea level rise in 55-25 BC, 36 years after the Mahabharata War. Enormous archaeology evidence. We looked at data points. I did not count, but possibly uh, 18 to 20, something like this. Okay. Uh, evidence from around the world corroborates this most important historical event of 6 millennium BC. And related to what I just discussed with this specific researcher or specific individual, uh, if triangulation of Pratyaksha and Anumana, for example, the Pratyaksha, the the pulse, the sudden sea level rise 1A exists. So the yeah, empirical evidence is there. But now to take that Pratyaksha and to draw inference and to in, in the process of drawing the inference, Anumana, if you do not correlate this with a Shruti, Smriti, Itihasa, Purana, okay, what is the outcome? The outcome, whatever it is, is always going to be careless, is going to be very casual, very naive, and actually idiotic. And that's exactly what has happened, as I just told you this story. Let me see if there is something else. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned that in another episode, no other historical world event, world event, not just related to India, not just related to Hindus and uh, Indians, but this is no other, no besides Mahabharata, no other historical world events, at least today, based on the evidence and knowledge we have, no other historical event provides such impressive empirical and scientific evidence. So guys, feel confident. Of course, study. Don't go on a blind faith just because I'm saying it. Study my books, read my blogs, watch all these episodes multiple times. But feel confident that there is no other historical world event, especially once you once you go back, say, beyond 1,000 years, okay, beyond 1,000 CE. That has the kind of impressive empirical and scientific evidence that we have for Mahabharata. No other event exceptions, none. So let nobody, no one come to you and tell you something about Alexander and has some evidence or some other personality. Just not there. Just not there. And we are talking of events that someone like Alexander is what? Two, about 2,000 years ago. Buddha, we don't know exactly the timing, but in the last 4,000 years. Still, there is no evidence. Aren't we lucky? That is the blessings and mercy of Krishna Dvaipayana Vasudeva. That we have this evidence in such a way that no other historical event, no other historical event of the last 7,500 years. Now forget this recent history of last 1,000 years or so has such an impressive empirical and scientific evidence. All right. So with that, I want to stop on this. This also concludes our archaeology evidence exploration for flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. And uh, in this uh, Shraddha and Pradnya series, we will get back to uh, astronomy evidence internal to Mahabharata text. And specifically, we will begin with uh, the evidence of Mercury and Venus. All right. I'll see you there shortly. Namaskar.